Happy Sunday, everyone. Welcome to church. Welcome, families. Good to see everybody out today. Uh, it's a good day. The sun is out. The rain has stopped for us today. And I know the kids have something special coming up uh, in a little bit. So we're going to release you soon, kids. Okay, we know you've got your movie and popcorn. That's because they've been so awesome in kids' church. So parents, you should be very proud of your children. They continue to amaze us each and every week. So kids, stay tuned. We'll let you go shortly. But first, we're going to worship our Lord. And I've just been thinking this week, reflecting on how good he is and all that he's done for me. And uh, he's a miracle-working God. And the big, biggest miracle that he's ever performed is changing a sinner's heart and one that loves him and follows him. So we're going to glorify that God who has worked many miracles in this family. So why don't we stand to our feet if you are able to, and we're going to worship this morning. We're going to start with a new song, but it's easy. You can get to it. Read the words. And uh, see what it is saying to us today. Well, I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, the shadows that fade. Never enough And you came along Put me back together And every desire Is now satisfied Here in your love Oh, there's nothing To show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, but oh, you've seen them all. You still call me friend. To the God of the mountain, to the God of the valley. Place and mercy and grace will find me again. There's nothing. Oh, there's nothing.
raise up all the prayers in the prayer book, all the thoughts, desires, wants, hopes, dreams, everything we put in there, Lord. We raise them up to you. May you breathe your life upon them. May your healing hand touch them. May you bless us. Bless us, Almighty Lord. Your grace and your power. We have faith and trust in you, Lord. Amen. All right. I'd just like to welcome everyone to church and everybody online. Thanks for coming this morning and making it out out of your day to come here and spend time worshipping the Lord. It's much appreciated. Now, um, if you come in early to church, we have a prayer room at 8.30 to 8.50 where we can have a little prayer huddle and you're more than welcome to, to come in and join along. The more the merrier. Yeah. You can all be seated if you like. We have three ways we can give here at House Church. We have the online deposit. We can um, text or we can tithe in the boxes. But personally, I, um, I think we have more than three ways to give. And um, I have confidence in our pastor. And um, seeing this church evolve from you know being in a school hall to having the small building at the back operating out there and... I'm moving into this large building and, you know, still developing. And um, to this day, our pastor does still not take a wage. So that gives me confidence. And, you know, we are known by our fruit. And I can see his fruit. And um, we can read in Second Corinthians uh, chapter 9 and 10 that he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for your sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Now, when you give, God will give back. And part of what you receive is to be planted for the next harvest. So, remember, when you feel it's time to harvest your blessings, that you cannot do so until you have sown the seed. So, you are given specifically a portion to be given to others. Now it's it's not just financially, it's not just tithing. You know, you need to say to yourself, what can I do for somebody else? Now, we should all have inside of us that I want to be a giver. And um, we can do this in many ways, whether it's just a simple compliment, a smile, an encouragement, whether it's financially. Or maybe it's just giving our time or a gift to somebody. You, know, you can do it simply and send an SMS, give a phone call, you know, reach out or pay somebody a visit and just show somebody some love. You can give your time, be a blessing to others. Or perhaps you'd just like to volunteer one day a month to, at your local shelter or, you know, buy food for the homeless. You know, there's many ways to give. And it'd be good for us to be instilled in us that we want to be a giver. All right. We do have some upcoming birthdays, which is quite exciting. All right. We've, we've got Noah. Noah Blakemore. Happy birthday. And Angel. Happy birthday, Angel. Daniel Hocking, Dan the man, all right, and Samson, Samson Brevetti, happy birthday. All right, just a couple of quick announcements. We've got youth on Friday nights at 6.30. If you, if you want to stay young, I'll tell you what, just go to the youth, they'll keep you young. No doubt about that. Um, soap groups, if you'd like to be connected, you know, make some new friends or just go a bit deeper in your faith. Um, we've got plenty of groups and different styles as well to, to suit each other. So 
Don't be shy. We've got our Easter services coming up. Um, Good Friday, be a nice hour long, and then Easter Sunday as well. So looking forward to those. They're always good. And um, if anyone's interested in the trip to Bogabilla, we've got coming up in, say, June, July. Um, Just talk to Julia if you're thinking about coming, but yeah, just start thinking about it. Start praying on it and, you know, be good to, to take some kids up there. I think about taking my kids up there. It'd be a good experience to, to show them, you know, another side of life. And you know, It's not just life on the Gold Coast. There's, there's plenty more out to it than that. And um, if you want any updates or any more information, just see the app. It, it's all on there. And um, we're just going to go back into worship now. So I'll hand you back to Nath. But uh, I'll ask you to stand up again while we worship and praise the Lord. Thank you. All right. We're going to do that song again. And it's just our worship. But I love the words that this says. Like I said, I was reflecting this week. And um, even this, this verse I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. And you came along, put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in the world. And that's out of that place, that chorus comes, nothing is better than you. I thank God for that, all that he's done for me. I don't know where I would be, what I'd be doing, if it wasn't for him. So I'm going to sing again this morning. Yes, it's a new one, but sing along. And if you can, I've been trying to teach Zoe this one a little bit. So here you go. Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, treasures that fade, never enough. And you came along and put me back together.
kids, at this point in time, you are so deserving of your movie and popcorn morning. So you can take your blankets, your pillows. If you're going to fall asleep, make sure you don't snore. But you can head across over to Kids Church. Enjoy your well-deserved prize. All right, we're going to stay in this moment of worship this morning. And I love that this church prioritizes making sure kids stay in that worship. This morning's a little different. They've got a special morning and we want them to enjoy the time that they have next door. But on this odd occasion where we aren't, don't have our kids here, where we would be modelling what worship looks like, I encourage you this morning to take the time to really worship for yourself, knowing that there's no kids around possibly to distract you. Maybe you've still got a little one here. You can still worship. But let's take this time right now and just between us and God, no one else, and really focus on entering into his presence, thanking him for all that he's done for us as we worship this morning. So Lord, we just exalt you. We thank you, Father, for all that you've done for us. You are worthy to be praised, Lord.
I do actually think that it's for someone online um, and it's because of God's beautiful grace that he wants to warn someone um, and God showed me the story in Ezekiel chapter 18 and if this is for you I really want you to go home and read it the whole chapter um, at this point in time the Israelites believed that if a man was wicked that his son should bear the consequences of that and they used to quote this proverb about grapes say the sour grapes um, and God was really firm and came to the Israelites and said no more will you even mention this proverb anymore because there's a problem with that because it's it's a lie from the pit of hell that God sees generations um, under the same banner when it comes to salvation. This whole chapter says that God sees the individual and judges the individual for who they are. But there's a problem. So what God wants to say to this person, whoever you are today, is the opposite of that. Your salvation is not secure because of your parents' salvation. Your salvation, and it's like when you go to the Northern Territory and there's signs, or Northern Queensland, there's signs that say there's crocodiles in the water, don't swim here. And you've missed the signs. The Bible says you must enter through the gate for yourself. Salvation is only through Jesus. It's not through your mum. It's not through your dad. It's not through your children. It's not through your spouse. It's not through your brother. It's not through your sister. You must enter through the gate yourself. And it's because of God's... I was just so overwhelmed with how much God loves you, whoever this word is for. This is Jesus fighting 
for you. He's saying, you've missed the signs. I've had signs up saying, beware, beware, and you've missed them. And now I'm sending someone to warn you because I'm fighting for you. I love you so much. And this is me being told on Wednesday night in the middle of the night that someone here needs to hear that your salvation isn't secure. It's not secure until you do your deal with Jesus yourself. You have to meet with Jesus yourself. You have to, you have to work out your salvation for yourself. Generations before you can't do it for you. Generations under you can't do it for you. You have to do it for yourself. And Jesus is fighting for you. So please heed the warning. Please listen because he sent this word for you today. I'm going to invite Bella up and she's going to read the word of God. Good morning, everyone. Uh, This morning I'll be reading from 1 Kings chapter 17. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord the God of Israel lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here, turn eastward and hide in the Kerith ravine east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kerith Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath, in the region of Sidon, and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he said, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid, go home and do as you have said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Thanks for that, Bella. Awesome to be able to read the Word in church and hear it uh, direct from the Bible and hear the Scripture. Nothing better than that. We could close now, and I'm sure we'd all get something out of that, Um, but sometimes it's good to unpack it a little bit and and get a feel for what it it means for us today. Uh, As we kind of immerse ourselves in this theme, or, or maybe it's really just like a focus and an emphasis on God and me, we get to see a lot of different facets be uncovered, a little... A little taste of that was last week, and if I want to touch on that quickly, it's with Kelly where she spoke a little bit from Psalm 139, and towards the end of that psalm, I, I really feel like that's a mandate on our lives for us to be able to say to God, search me, O God, and know my heart, test me, and know my thoughts, that we would be able to go open ourselves up transparently to the Lord and say, have a look, have a look, but then let's go that step further, what the scripture says, point out anything in me that offends you, and I'm not talking about make me good, help me to do good things and be a good person. I'm talking about point out any barriers between you and me, God. Point out any things that maybe it's thoughts, maybe it's, it's different uh, things you've carried, different behaviors, maybe it's stuff that I've been holding on to. What is it that's causing a barrier between me and you, God? Point it out in me because we know that sin can be a barrier between us and God, but we also know that man's attempts, as Kelly said, to cover up sin 
that that's been cursed, that's done away with when she pointed out the fig leaves. But in fact, there is a new way. And he says, point out in me the things that offend, offend you, things that you need to remove so I can get close to you. And James 4 says that if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. And then it goes a step further. The scripture finishes off and says, and lead me on the path everlasting. That we have a new covenant and a new way through his son Jesus, that he's made a way for us to the Father, and that we can walk that path everlasting if we open ourselves up and be transparent before the Lord, and he can have a look and deal with those things. And you know, God really challenged me lately. He challenged me when we've been on this topic, when we've been focusing in, and he said, Nick, do you love me? Do you love me, Nick? It's kind of like a bit Peter-esque. If you go into the New Testament, he says, Jesus says that to Peter, you know, do you love me? Um, And And I'm thinking, of course I love you, God. Like, saved at 17, 35 years old. I've been walking walking the right path, I hope. You know, living for you. I've been teaching my kids about you. I'm here, aren't I? I'm here. And he says, yeah, okay, yeah, right. Well, do you love me for who I am? Or do you love me for what I've given you, what I've accomplished in your life? And I went, oh, okay, maybe it's a bit of both. Maybe, maybe Maybe it's a bit of both, isn't it, God? Is that is that love? Is and, and you and I both know sometimes when you love someone just for what they can give you, sometimes circumstances come in and when you don't feel like you're getting something from that person, then maybe that love fades. But if you love someone for who they are, it's quite different, isn't it? And he challenged me, you know, do you love me for who I am? And I think, yeah, yeah, I think I do. Well, who am I? Who am I? How well do we know God? How well do you know him? How much time do you spend getting to know him? And it was a challenge to me. It made me think of this passage in John chapter 6 where Jesus feeds the 5,000 and then he goes across, um, across the water, miraculously gets to the other side. People are a bit confused. How did you get here, Lord? You know, you, you just fed us over there. And What's been happening, Rabbi? And he said, hang on, hang on. Truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but you seek me because you had your fill of the loaves. And what he's saying is you didn't see the signs and see that I'm the Messiah and, and see that I am who I say I am. You don't want me for me. You see me because you were hungry and you had bread and fish and now you want more. And he's saying, do you love me for who I am or for what I can give you? Seek the bread of life. Seek that which the Father gives you for eternity. And he challenged me but because in, in that passage, just before he goes over the water, he goes and steals away and has some time with him and the Father. He goes into solitude. And, and Jesus and the Father are one. It seems like that might come pretty naturally to him. But maybe I have to work at it a little bit more than that. But time and time again, we see Jesus steal away and recharge and refresh and fill up and have communion with the Father. To spend time with the Father. You know, John chapter 10 says says that Jesus is the good shepherd. That's how he refers to himself. That he's our shepherd and that we're his flock and that we're his sheep. And that we will know the voice of our shepherd and that... He will know us, and then we will follow him. But how do you get to know the voice? I got a chance to meet with Stuart Douglas recently. That's Kimberly Douglas's husband. You know, they came and ministered a couple of weeks ago, and how good was that over that weekend if you were here, if you got a chance to get a taste of any of it? And I got a chance to sit down with Stuart, and he was, was just like, it's great, Nick. It's great that you're bringing the, your prayers to God, and you're, you know, you're laying your stuff on him, and you're open with him, and you're honest. But if you, if you ever just shut up, <laughs> and he didn't mean with him, he meant... Just in front of God, do you ever just be quiet and just listen? And I was like, silent then. Uh, maybe, I, maybe I don't do that very much, Stuart. He's like, yeah, well, it's like, a, it's like a kid who comes to his dad and he's got all these amazing things to say about the day, but he's asking all these questions and he's unsure about all these things and he's laying it all on dad and dad can't even get a word in edgewise to speak. Do you have kids like that? I know I have experiences like that especially when they get to an age where they know everything. Uh, and he, you know, he was challenging me. Do you go to God and have all this stuff, but then not be quiet long enough to hear him? In, this, in the Bible, it talks about the secret place. It talks about being able to take shelter under the wings of the Lord. It refers to it in Psalm 91. Maybe you've heard of that before. Maybe you've heard of it in a song. I heard Pastor Jeremy say it on stage during a prayer the other week. It says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And and it translates also to he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. In Psalm 27, it it talks about shelter as well. In Psalm 31, it talks about the covering. 
in Matthew 6, it talks about going away and locking the door and, cl- and closing it and, and in your room, praying to your Father who hears you in secret. But it's not about a place. It's not about a prayer cave or your car or your room or whatever it is. It's actually just you communing with God one-on-one. It's you getting to know the voice of your shepherd. It's you coming to God. And it's not your podcast in your car or, or your Bible study or your church corporate prayer like this. And That stuff's great, and that stuff's super important. Praying with your partner, super important. important. We, don't, we don't do it enough. You know, we don't do enough for that stuff. That's great, but actually, it's just about you and God. Me and him, silent sometimes. Most of the time, it should be me, silent, listening. Getting to know what the voice of my shepherd sounds like so I can recognize it, and then I can do what he says. The secret place. You know, the Bible tells us, like we said in James 4, if you draw near to him, he will draw near to you. It tells us that we can actually, if we seek him, we will find him in Matthew 7. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. It's just like, well, we have ears, but are we listening? And challenge me, you know, Psalm 22 says that those who come will be fed. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. That actually, if we do listen for him, like in John 10, we might be able to hear the voice of our shepherd and we might be able to deal with some of those things that are barriers between us and him. That we might be able to take it to another level with him. And we might be able to actually hear what he's saying and then do it. So we'll pick up where, where Bella left off in, in 1 Kings in chapter 17. And we take over with a guy named Elijah. He's a prophet. Now, a prophet is a, is a man or woman of God. In this particular case, is a man named Elijah. And Elijah was a really solid guy. Now, Elijah communed with God. Elijah heard from God. And if he was a prophet at that time, that meant he was a mouthpiece of God. He would go around and speak God's word over the nation. And there was a king that he was referring to as he was speaking with. His name was Ahab. Now, do you you know that the Israelites never used to have a king? That God was their king. And they used to have judges and leaders and people and systems in place. And they said, we want a king, God. He said, oh, that's not such a good idea. Why do you want a king? They said, well, the other nations have a king. We want some guy to sit up there on a throne and lead us. That's what we want. So he said, all right, let's see how that goes. So they got Saul. And Saul had a lot of idiosyncrasies. Saul had a lot of issues. And Saul brought his issues to the table. And they had David, and David was really good. But there weren't a lot of really good kings throughout that history. And then you get to Ahab. And in the preceding chapter, it says, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. If that's written about you in the Bible, that's no good. You're a bad dude. I I refer to him... To my kids, when I tell the, the kids, we did a kids version of this yesterday, I said, that's the baddie king. Because if, if that dude's done more to provoke the Lord, man, what has he done that that got the mention in the Bible? In fact, he was putting up idols. He was putting up things that were statues and objects, and he was saying, worship this, don't worship God. He was drawing the attention of the nation away from God. That's a pretty big deal. And so Elijah confronts him. And this is the type of thing that prophets do. They confront kings. And he confronted him. He said, you know what? The rain is going to stop. There will be a drought in this land many years. And it's until the word of the Lord comes again and says that the drought will be ended. That's a pretty big deal. Because what he's saying to the king is he's saying, you think you're in control. You think you've got the power. But you actually don't have any power. So let's see what happens when it stops raining. On a civilization that's built on agriculture and it stops raining, that's a pretty big deal. I mean, Australia, when it stops raining, we go through drought, and it's not funny. It's not a laughing matter. It's a really, really big deal, and it's serious, and it's hard. But we're a first world country with systems in place that help us get through those times as best we can. Imagine an ancient civilization with no time to prepare, and none of that infrastructure in place, and the rain just stops. And when it stopped, it wasn't just like, oh, here's a warning, it will come. Like back in the day in ancient Egypt, there was a warning, and it came through Joseph, and it was just like that. It's going to stop raining. It's going to be a drought. And God had prepared a plan in place for years to make, for the years to come, to make sure that they had storehouse built up. It wasn't like that. When Elijah said to Ahab, it's going to stop raining, it stopped raining. And it didn't rain for years. And so God wisely says, time to go to Elijah. 
time to depart. He says, you need to get out of here. Because when you tell a king that you don't, like especially a king like that, that you don't have power, the power is the Lord's, generally speaking, they will shoot the messenger in that society. And so they say to Elijah, okay, it's time to get out. And Elijah agrees because he's actually seen pretty much every single other prophet get slaughtered to this point that stood up for the Lord. And says, depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook of Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and I've commanded the ravens to feed you there. Okay, at this point, we know that he says to Elijah, depart from here, and we know that Elijah goes, I'm listening. So what did we talk about before? It's just like, are we hearing the voice of God? Are we discerning that it is the voice of our shepherd? So Elijah, he communes with God, and he sits still, and he listens. He recognizes God's voice. So one, he listens for God's voice. Two, he recognizes it's God's voice. Three, he hears the command and he does it. Depart from here. Go to the brook of Cherith, which is each of the Jordan. And, I, and then four comes the promise, right? Four comes the promise. So it doesn't go, and how often do we do this? It doesn't go, okay, I've heard from God. He's given me the promise. He's given me the provision. And now I'm going to go do what he says. Now it doesn't work like that. Although it's how I want it to work. He says, here's the voice of the Lord. This is what I'm telling you to do. You obey the command, and then the fruit comes. And if I was Elijah, I have to say, I probably would at this point, when he says, yep, okay, depart from here, go to Cherith, you should drink from the brook, great, okay, I get away from the king, I survive, I do your work, I get to drink from the brook, great, so this brook has, you know, some extra water, even though the, the drought's coming, this is a good spot to get water, and the ravens will feed you there. I probably would stop at this point myself and go, perhaps we could explore other plans. Perhaps this one is a little bit, um, you know, I've got an uncle, and it's west of the Jordan, and we get along great. I could live in his basement. He could feed me. I'd be safe. No? Do you think you would just be, like, all on board? I don't know. Maybe, maybe we want to know what God wants us to do, but sometimes it's so hard. I've had stuff like this in my life where it's so hard to fathom me doing that in my own strength that I question if it's from God. Like, honey, I've been practicing the secret place stuff and, you know, that stuff Nick talked about at church and, I, you know, I've been listening and, and it's been cool. It's been good. God's given me an idea of, of how much I need to give. And, you know, well, it does line up with the word and I did speak to the pastors about it and yeah, well, yeah, they, they were in agreement, and I ran it by the people I really trust and, and people of faith, and yeah, look, I mean, I got that prophecy from Kimberly, and it was bang on this, actually, but I don't know if it's, it's I think it's from me. I think it's from me. I don't really know that this is uh, from God. It's probably not the voice of my shepherd. I'm not going to give that because it's a bit big. Go and be in the wilderness with the ravens, and they will feed you. And Elijah just goes, all right, let's do it. Let's do it. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. And I would be thinking, maybe can a raven come here, feed me, and then I'll know that they'll do it there. But he goes, no, I'm going to obey the word of the Lord, and then I'll see the promise. It says he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook of Cherith that is east of the Jordan. And after he did what God said, the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Um, from the brook. So we see he did what he was told, and then all of a sudden he received the fruit and the provision. The crazy thing here is that he didn't just camp by the brook. He didn't just go, I'll keep my house by the Jordan, and then I'll, I'll rent my condo out in Egypt, and then I'll go take the camper van to Cherith, and we'll have a long weekend. Or, or maybe we'll spend like a couple weeks there and, and just wait till things die down. He went and lived by the brook of Cherith. He lived. He pulled up stumps and went, I live here now until the next command. I live in the Lord's promise. I live in what he's called me to do. He lived by the brook of Cherith. So often we want it the other way around, hey. So often we want to know what we're going to get and then get a little taste of it first and then take the step of faith. But that's not a step of faith. And of course, after a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. That's right, I predicted that this would happen. There's a drought, and the brook dried up. And then what's next? 
you know, this really is the God and me stuff. Pastor Jeremy got up here for a little bit and talked about God and me, and he said there's going to be things in your life that God's going to say, it's time to pick that up again. It's time to pick that thing up. You've put it aside. You've laid it aside. But God is telling you it's time to pick that thing up again and run down the path that I've commanded you. And then there's going to be things that God is telling you it's time to put that down now. It's time to stop that now and follow the path that I have for you over here. It's changed. This is always part of the plan, but you've got to get on board with the change. It's time to put that down. And he says to Elijah, or Elijah sees the brook getting skinnier, Week by week, day by day. He said to me, you know, when we got into business about eight and a half years ago, it was a challenge. It was difficult. It took faith. We had to step out, but God laid the path, and then it was awesome, and there was provision, and we ate, and we drank of the lamb. You know, we were enjoying the provision of taking that step of faith. And then there were things that came in to distract us. There were things that maybe said, okay, we, sh- we should sell now because things might change and then, and then we, should, we should actually go across the street because they're offering us a bigger and better shop, literally. This is the things that happen. And we'll just break the lease and we'll just do this and God would say, listen to my voice. Recognize the voice of your shepherd. Stay where you're at until I tell you to move. And then we got to the end of the lease and it was like, okay, we've been offered a renewal everything we've been working for, and God would say, it's time to go. It's time to go. But this is what I've been working for. This is what I've wanted. Now, the loan's gone. This is where I can bed down and really make something of this. And God's saying, hang on, are you listening to the voice of the Lord? The brook is drying up. It is time to go. And so Elijah gets ready to go. And sometimes we don't want to go because the thing he's telling us to go to is even harder to imagine than the thing before. Let me give you an example. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. That's even more unlikely than the ravens in this situation. To, to Elijah, who lived in that time, that is even more of a crazy scenario for him to get into than the ravens. Let me tell you, a widow, we understand, is someone who has lost their husband. And in that society, the male was the one who earned the provision. And without them, the only way for this widow to not be in poverty was to either have a family member who would redeem her and marry her from that husband's family. And that did not occur for the widow Zarephath, so she was on her own. Or she could have a son old enough who would work and provide for them. And she did not have a son old enough. She had a son who was young, and she had to provide for him. And so you've got, in the best of times, this widow is poor. This is not the best of times. This is the worst of times. This is the middle of the drought in which the brook has actually dried up now. So the drought's been going for a very long time. And so you get to a widow who is living in a society built on agriculture, in which her, likely her greatest means of provision was to go into the land once everyone had picked from the harvest and collect off the ground that which was left over, the scraps. But without the rain, there is no crop and there is no harvest and there are no scraps. So there's nothing. And this widow, in the middle of a serious drought, is going to be who's providing for you. If you thought the ravens was interesting, Elijah, get ready for what's next. You're going to meet the widow of Zarephath, and she will provide for you. But of course, Elijah, a faithful man of God, has listened to the word of the Lord, has recognized the voice of his shepherd, has heard the command that says, Arise and go to Zarephath, and has collected his things and moved. And he went to Zarephath, and he came to the gate of the city. Behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he said to her, you know, bring me some water. And so he gets there. And you think, great, all right. I walk in. This lady here is the widow. Perfect. She's come to greet me. I would imagine if God's told me, I've commanded a widow there to feed you, that he's let her know. I would hope. Maybe to make it a little less of an awkward situation. But in fact, 
She does not know. I, like, I would, have, I would have walked in there and kind of been like, hey, you're here to, okay, awesome. You meet me at the gate, uh, the man of God. Did um, God, um, did, he, did he say any? Did he, say, did he tell you I was, Elijah. Eli- shh, 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 shh. Ahab's not supposed to know I'm here. Did he know, you knew I was coming, right? No. No. He didn't say anything? Okay. Okay. It's like when your buddy invites you over for dinner and he hasn't told his wife. Have you ever had that one? Have you ever had that one? <laughs> like maybe you get to the door and you're like, hey, and they're, hey, Nick, hey, you, are you dropping something over for Mark or you're not, you're dropping something up? No, you're here for dinner. Oh, yeah. No, no, honey, no, honey, you didn't, no, you, honey, you didn't tell me. No, come on in, Nick. Come on in. You can, no, you can have my dinner. It's okay. It's awkward. And he says to her, you know, can you bring me a little bit of water? hospitality in that culture and there's a well and so she's there's, maybe they've got a little bit of water left in that in that environment she goes to bring it and he calls her and said bring me a morsel of bread in your hand as well and she says as the lord your god lives i have nothing baked only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug and now i am gathering a couple of sticks that i may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die this is, a, this is a lady who's lost hope. She has lost hope. She has lost hope for the present. I mean, she's grieving the loss of her husband. She's trying to do her best for her child. She's probably getting handouts and help where she can. She's, she's talking about the jars that she's got at home. You know, she's, I'm not talking about your glass cashew jar in the cupboard that you can see getting lower and it gets to a third of the way full and I'm going to go to Aldi and pick up some cashews. I'm talking about a clay jar, an earthen jar. You can't really see in it. You can't see the levels going up and down. You've got to check. And she's looking in there week by week, day by day, seeing how much she has left. I've got a week left maybe. Someone comes by and fills up a little bit, helps you out. And now she's counting the days, pours it out in her hand, sifts through it. I've got about two or three days left. And now she's got a handful of flour and a little bit of oil. And she swirls around. And she has lost hope for her present, but she's also lost hope for her future. You know, she's out there. I mean, who are our kids if not our future? She's saying that I'm going to make this meal for me and my son, and we are going to eat it, and we are going to die. So now she's lost hope for her future as well. Sometimes God tells us to do things, and it honestly has nothing to do with us. You know, it might benefit you to hear from God, and it might benefit us to know His voice and to carry out His instruction, but sometimes it has absolutely nothing to do with you. Like, do we really think that Elijah was there just for him? I mean, he was going to survive. Absolutely, God was going to provide for him. But this seemed to have a lot to do with the widow and her son, too. And she's desperate. She's saying, as the Lord your God lives, she knows who Elijah is. She knows this is a man of God. And you know what she's saying there? She's saying, I promise. When she says that, I swear to you, of course I would invite you in. Of course I would be hospitable to you. I want to provide for the man of God. I have nothing left to give. Nothing. Nothing. Maybe not just bread either. I have nothing left to give. I'm emotionally spent. I don't know what I have left to give to my child, to you, to anybody. Maybe you're here and you have a little bit of that connection with the widow Zarephath. Maybe it's not just the bread that's running out. Maybe it is more in us. Maybe there is a drought in your spirit that says, I have nothing left to give you. And we're talking about God and me. And we're talking about getting into your secret place. And we're talking about spending the time with the Lord and giving generously and all these kinds of things. And you're saying, I have got one more ounce and I'm going to spend it on me. I've got nothing left. And Elijah says to her, do not fear. Isn't that the only thing we say to people who 
are afraid when we can comfort them. And, you know, my son, when he was two years old, he lays in his bed and there's a thunderstorm outside and the lightning's crashing. He doesn't know what's going on. He's crying. I sit next to him and I say, when he was two years old, I just say, hey, it's okay. Don't be afraid. You're safe. You're safe. And Elijah just says to her, do not be afraid. Go and do as you said. But first... Make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. Put a pin in that. I'm going to come back to it. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day of the Lord. And he sends rain upon the earth. So she hears the voice of the Lord. When you hear from Elijah and he says, thus says the Lord, you know God's talking. So she hears the voice of the Lord. She knows it's the voice of her shepherd. She knows. And on the other side, that's one and two. On four, she knows that he said, the jars aren't going to go empty. The jug will not be spent. But what's in the way? What's in the way is three. You've got to go and do this. The command is in the way of that. The command is between when you hear, Lord, and you receive the fruit, the command. And what's the command? He says, first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me and then make you and your son. He's not selfish. He's not hungry enough that he's saying, go and make me the cake first because I need it now. He's saying, go and give the last of what you have. She goes in there and she's not going into her house and looking at 16 different jars filled with flour. She's not looking at an overflowing jug of oil. She's going and looking at those earthen vessels and she's She's seeing the same thing she saw before. She's opening it up. She's pouring out what little she thinks she has. She's making it. She's making that cake for him. She's baking that bread. She's pouring the oil on. It's a little swill around the top. And then she's bringing it out to him. And then she's got to go back. And she's got to believe and stand on faith and believe that there is something left. She's got to believe that the promise was true. And so she walks back in. And it's not like it's just going to be full. She's going to pour enough out for her and her son. And she's going to make a bread. She's going to bake the bread. And then she's going to eat. And then the next day, she's going to wake up. And she's got to have the faith to believe. She can pour a little bit more out again. And bake the bread. And eat and survive. Until the rain comes again. Until the rain comes again. Now God is saying to you, if you are dry in your spirit, if there is a drought in you, if you have felt like, when is the rain going to come again? All I have left is this handful of flour, this swill of oil. I have nothing left to give you. I have nothing left to give. Were you worried about your child and you pray for them and nothing changes? Were you in your business and you don't know what you're going to do? Where you're in your job and you can't take any more of it. Where your relationships are breaking down. Where God is asking you to give more and more and you're saying, I have nothing left. This is all I have. I'm broken. I'm dry. And the God would say to you, give it. Give it. Give that last little bit. But it's all that I have left. I swear to you, as the Lord your God, give it. Pour it out as an offering. When she pours that out as an offering to Elijah, that's as unto the Lord. That's as unto the Lord. She gave it to the man of God. She poured it out as an offering. And he's saying, just give it. Give that last bit of what you have left to give. And your jar will not be empty. Your jug will not be spent. I will fill it as it goes. Your jar will not be empty. Your jug will not be spent until the rain comes again. That Jesus would say in John 6, 35, that I am the bread of life. They said, give us this bread always. And he said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger. And he who believes on me will never thirst. That I will fill you. That he who comes to me will never be hungry, will never be thirsty again. It will never run empty. And the rain of the Holy Spirit will fall upon the dry ground, the arid ground of our spirit. 
and rejuvenate the dry places that once were, that we would hear His voice and obey it, and that we would see that the rivers of living water would rise up within us and flow in and out of our lives into the lives of those around us, that His promises would be true. Give it. Hand it over. And trust Him. And receive the promise. The rain will fall again. The season will change. And it will fall on your life again. And it will release you into a new promise. I'd love if you would stand with me today, guys. And I'll just invite the musicians to come as we move to a close. You know, this lady, in case you're interested in how it ends, she went and did as Elijah said. She heard the voice of the Lord. She recognized the voice of the shepherd. She did God as commanded her. And she received the, the blessing. Her and her family ate for many days. And the time came when the, the drought did break at the word of the Lord. And she was able to be provided for again. You know, maybe us and the widow have a lot more in common than we think. Whether it be in the physical, whether it be, whether it be in the spiritual, you know, maybe there's a lot more that we can relate to her. You know, that handful of flour, that little bit of oil, God would say to us, it won't run out. It won't run out. You know, Elijah, he goes in, uh, in Kings, in, in chapter 19, just a little bit later, he goes and he has his own moment. And he spends time with God and he, he's, he's seeking God out to commune with him. And he goes to the mountain of the Lord and there's this, this hectic rushing wind and it tears a side off a mountain, it tears a piece off the mountain. And, and it's, the Bible says that the Lord wasn't in it. And there was an earthquake and the Lord wasn't in it. And there was a fire and the Lord wasn't in it. And said, there was a low whisper. And he wrapped his face and he went out to commune with God. If we can catch that, it starts with, all of that starts with us being able to get before God, God and me, get before him under the shelter of his protection. That's what the secret place is. Under the covering of his wings. Doesn't matter where you do it. And just spend time listening, getting attuned to what his voice sounds like. Understanding the voice of our shepherd, that he is our good shepherd, that we would know him, that we would follow him, and he would know us. And that none would perish, but he would bring us into everlasting life. And then we could be able to step into the promises he has for us the sound of his voice would come in a low whisper and he would meet with us there. And Jesus said that he is the bread of life, that all who come to him shall never be hungry and all who believe in him shall not thirst. No matter what drought we're going through, what season we might face, he will sustain us. It will not go empty. The jar will not go empty until the rain comes. Father God, we just thank you so much for your word. We thank you that you sent your son Jesus for us, that we might have an opportunity to be reunited with you and know you and inherit eternal life alongside you, Lord. We thank you for the truth of your word that tells us that we can hear you and that you want to speak to us. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us to hear from you, to recognize your voice, to follow you wholeheartedly, to see through your commands and to receive your provision. Please, God, help us to get through those difficult times when it feels like we've got nothing left. Fill us up to be able to be overflowing that we might give to others as well.
God still wants to do some things and God still wants to do some things here and um, I really believe this is a holy moment if that's you um, that I had the word for you before and you need to give your heart to the Lord please don't delay do it today we can pray together now and we can pray at the front if that was for you and you're here today Nick's word I think was for a lot of people today if that's if you want prayer for that today there is there is something about walking forward and and laying it at the altar there is something doesn't matter whether we've been with the Lord for 50 years we all need to still come back to the altar and lay stuff down and say that's me so we're going to do that now but I'm going to pray now because I don't want people who are online to miss out either and I don't want you to switch off yet so we're going to pray together for both salvation, if that's you. If you need to give your heart to the Lord today because you've been relying on someone else's salvation, we're going to do that now because today is a day of salvation. If you're broken and dry and have nothing left to give except the tiniest little bit in your hand, we're going to deal with that now because God gave that word to Nick for today because today is the day. So let's pray together now. Jesus, we're just coming to you. Jesus, you are beautiful and you fight for us. You love us so much that you would send people to warn us, to tell us, to, to bring your word to us, Lord, when we're dry. Because you love us and you're fighting for us. Jesus, for those people who have been distracted and thought that they had salvation but never come to you for themselves, Lord. Lord, we just come together, Lord, and we say, you are the Lord. Lord, we've sinned and we're not perfect and we need you. Would you be our Lord and Saviour? Would you be the boss of our lives? Would you be the shepherd that Nick was talking about? The shepherd whose voice we can hear and who will guide us through the rest of our lives. Lord, we can't do it on our own anymore. It's not working. So Jesus, we come to you and we ask you to be our shepherd, be our saviour. We repent, we turn away from our sin and we run towards you, Jesus. And we thank you that that means we get eternal life with you. 
It's that simple. That's all you ask us to do is turn from our sin and run to you. And that's it. You do the rest. You've done the rest. We thank you for doing it. And Jesus, for those of us who have not very much left, not very much at all. Jesus, thank you for telling us that message today. Thank you for sending Nick to tell us that that it's okay, that you're going to do the work, that you're going to make sure we can keep going, that you're going to turn the tiny little bit that we have into something substantial that's going to sustain us. And Jesus, we just, we humble ourselves today before you because even if we've been with you for 50 years, for 30 years, for 10 years, Lord, we're still just a humble mess before you. We're still just desperate for you. We still need you desperately. We're still lacking so much. And we just come to you today, Lord, humbly, wanting more, needing more, needing your help, needing you to whisper in our ear. Jesus, we come to you, Lord. Lord, whether it's right where we are at home, it's whether it's in our seats, whether we come down the front and, and make a statement, Lord, we cry out to you wherever we are, Lord. And we say, come and be our shepherd. Come and be our healer. Come and be our enough. I just want you.
Yes, Jesus. We're going to officially close the meeting. If you've got to do something, you're more than welcome to leave. And online, thank you for joining us. Have a great day. But there's nothing else. So don't rush off. Ben, tinkle away for a little bit longer. And if you need prayer, we'd love to pray with you. Being a pastor is about praying for people and standing with people. It's not about all the other things that sort of come with it. And do you know what? It's the job you don't get to do very often. Um, so indulge us. Let me pray for someone today. So if you want prayer, come up the front, we'll pray. But otherwise, just sit. Let the, let the Spirit minister to you. Let the Spirit um, just talk to you and speak to you. And maybe ask that question. What do I need to pick up? What do I need to lay down? What do I need to do? What promise do I need to fulfill to walk in what you have um, what you have have for me. Amen. That story was fantastic, Nick. I could just see parts in my life, just very similar things that go, I either need to do that or I'm glad I did that. So, Lord, we thank you for each and every person here. We thank you for the ones listening later or now with us online. Lord, I just pray for your Holy Spirit to touch them, for your Holy Spirit to go, your hand. I just see the Holy Spirit's hand now reaching out and touching people touching people, reaching inside people's lives and hearts and starting to just massage and, and make things right and starting to whisper things into people's lives, starting to whisper encouragement, whisper a word of knowledge, whisper direction and a future and a hope in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week. Caught up in your presence